Welcome to the Flamin Connect podcast, a podcast focused on the individual pieces that make up the larger community of people together doing what's right and making a difference. Today's hosts, we have myself, Trevor Grindy, Regan Kuntz, and Mitch Flamin. Do you know what a 15-minute city is? Um, I've heard this before. So everything is accessible within 15 minutes of where you live. And I think it's 15 minutes of walking. Okay, yeah. Hadn't heard of it. Don't really listen much to like a lot of the politics and stuff going on in the world. I don't like right now. I just don't really care for the last couple of years. Yeah. Pandemic stuff. It's just been, it's been tough. So, but anyway, I had a conversation with a friend the other day and they were talking about how all of our freedoms and rights are getting taken. And then the next thing is these 15 minute cities. It's like, what? He said, yeah, they're going to have one in Edmonton. I was like, okay. I have no idea what he's talking about. So I Google it. And it was, yeah, it was along the lines of this. Everything you need is going to be within 15 minutes walking distance. But like, I think like produced within. Anyway, it was wild. Mm -hmm. Look, look it up. And then Mm -hmm. on the radio, just driving into work today. Same thing. They're talking about these 15 minute cities. It's like, okay, interesting. But to your point, I think people are going to start growing more stuff themselves that they can. And you know what? Arguably, I think people should, if they have the means to like, yeah. You're just kind of getting back to what it was all about. I know my wife's talking about it and I laugh because I think there's things that make sense to do yourself that like you could save money. But then I also watch her make pierogies. And if she made if she made minimum wage, those would still be the most expensive pierogies <laughs> yeah. that anyone's ever I eaten know. because it like takes a day a to make time, yeah. like a dozen of them. To do them by hand. And yeah. I can muck those things in like three minutes. I know. Yeah. So back to your point of the 15-minute cities, that's an idea that's been around for a long time. Because I remember in the early 90s, there was a an article in Popular Mechanics, and they were mm-hmm. talking about population growth and how uh, Japan was running out of space to build out, so they were building up. Yeah. So what they were planning on doing is having these pods. So people who lived in a specific pod, they would live there, they would work there, they would get their groceries there, they would do everything there, and they wouldn't need to travel to other pods. Yeah. Mm. And everything was within walking distance. You didn't have to go anywhere. And there was a greenhouse on the roof, right? Like, yeah. Is that, I remember yeah. that was a big thing in the last, I don't know, decade or two. But yeah, I think, I don't know, as the world grows, there's going to be all sorts of thoughts and discussions and we're somewhat spoiled here. I mean, if you take a look at how many market gardens there are in Saskatoon, I know like we yeah. go to north of yeah. Martinsville to get our milk um, most of the time at the creamery there. It, it's just so much better. You pay a little bit more, but oh, the milk there yeah. is fantastic, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of excess or we, we have exposure to it. The challenge you have is at this time of the year or in the winter time, right, yeah. is, is how do you get fresh produce in the winter unless it's imported? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where going to Costco and spending some money is probably worthwhile for four or five months of the year. Okay. Pop quiz. What crop have Canadian farmers been growing for years, but only recently became legal to grow in the U S mustard. Why do you say mustard? Mustard is a very difficult crop to get out of certain RMs. Um, to or just to get rid of once you grow it. If there's a bunch of volunteers, it's uh, extremely difficult to flush it out. Hmm. Well, what was Ill- illegal to grow in the U.S.? Hemp, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll stick with mustard, but hemp's a hemp legitimate. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of what the states wasn't able to grow. Unless oats, maybe. No. Mm. I'm going with hemp. That was a good one, Reggie. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, way to give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? Was that, <laughs> that it? <laughs> yeah, it is. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the few farms that do grow hemp had to have been licensed um, by, tight, uh, by Health Canada, subject to tight regulations. And the reason that industrial hemp is closely related to marijuana, although it has only a trace amount of the psychoactive ingredient, you can't get high from smoking hemp. Hemp uh, had been illegal to grow in both Canada and the U.S. for a lot of years, and hemp farming became legal in Canada in 98 and only recently legal in the U.S. So the fiber from hemp or oil from the seed has numerous uses like textiles, pulp uh, for paper, soap, bug repellent, and high-nutrient foods. 
So the reason I know this is because... Because he told you. No, well, okay, there's that. No, no, no. I wouldn't say the reason I know this, but I remember as a, like when I was younger, we we grew organic hemp. And I think it was like a like a project thing we were doing or we were experiment. I Who knows? But in school? No. Like we had... Uh, we didn't see the full quarter of it, but there was an absolute section in our field that was... I don't think it was a full quarter. It, it was right around these Saskatoon berry trees that I'm telling you. Like, I think maybe my dad wanted to become like some sort of orchard man or something. But like, yeah, we we absolutely had uh, part of the quarter section was seeded to organic hemp. And we would take all of our friends out there and show it to them. And they just couldn't believe their eyes. Yeah. It would be neat to see how they process the stocks and stuff to actually make the rope and the textiles and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that'd we, be... we learned about it in school. Like the, the fiber of it is, yeah, there's so much stuff you can do with it. So much stuff. It's a rank crop though. Like they, they harvest it late and if it's not dried right, it can just wrap and twist right around the rotor of the combine mm-hmm. and it, it, it's a destroyer. I'm only thinking the reason we stopped growing it is because it was like, well, this is way more of a pain in the ass than growing wheat or yeah. anything else that we grew. Is like, yeah. this sucks. What's the longest recorded flight by a chicken? <laughs> 13. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's the multiple choice here? I almost spit out an ass. And what are we talking about? Maybe we don't so get I, the multiple choice. Maybe we just guess. When I look at this question, I'm like, I would have liked to be the guy that was trying to get the longest flight out of the chicken. Yeah, the, I know. <laughs> the one that threw him out of the plane. Yeah. Like that yeah. guy. Yeah. That's like, yeah. <laughs> Remember that WKRP episode with the uh, flying turkey? Frozen turkeys. Yeah, yeah. frozen turkeys. <laughs> it's mayhem down here. <laughs> um, do we get multiple choices on this? Or? If you like. Yeah, okay. I need them. I need them. Okay. 13 seconds, 21 seconds, 47 seconds, or one minute? 47 seconds. A chicken. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I'm going with a minute. There's no way, but no, it's only 13 seconds. So okay. 13 seconds is the longest <laughs> recorded flight. Overestimated the flight of the chicken. <laughs> yeah. If it's a question, it's got to be something substantial. Yeah. Although another kind of interesting point is the longest distance recorded by a chicken flight is 301 and a half feet in that many seconds. Eh? Well, or less. Or, or, less. or less. It's just, yeah. You could have had a good flyer. Mm. Yeah. A good distance a flyer. A glider. Like a if nice you've seen glider. Chicken Run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 13 seconds. Hmm. All right. Fun fact. There are only two turtles native to Saskatchewan. The snapping turtle and the western painted turtle. And both turtles are illegal to keep as pets. Have or throw out on a <laughs> go-kart track, <laughs> Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen a live turtle in Saskatchewan? Closest thing I've seen is a salamander. Oh yeah, but like not, not a turtle. Like, well, let's back like a, up. Not in the wild. Uh, That's what I you're know asking. People is have in the seen wild. them down by uh, Pike Lake. They've seen turtles down there. Would they be in the river? Is that a dumb question? I'm gonna go with no. I've seen lots not. of turtles in Saskatchewan. I know lots of people that have actually had turtles as pets. Mm-hmm. But like, no, I've never seen a wild turtle. I, I have never no seen idea. it either, but I, like I said, I know Pike Lake does have some. It's time for Now You Know. It's the part of the program where we talk to people, experts in their field, various varieties and various areas of farming. Today we're talking with David Fielding. So David, in previous episodes, we talked about foliar feeding, the ideas around it, and how it works. So now let's dive into slow-release nitrogen and how that works with the foliar feeding idea. So one of the aspects of slow release nitrogen is that it is a nonpolar unit and over millions and billions of years, the, the plants that we see outside, they won, right? From an evolutionary perspective, they won. Everything else didn't survive, but the blade of grass that's outside survived. The carrot in your garden survived. The corn in the field survived. And how it did that it, it, at least from a leaf surface standpoint is it it rains and has rained for billions of years and somehow our plants have evolved to have a an outer layer that takes that very polar water molecule and it beads up and it falls off 
And so in, in, in the industry, you deal with ag chemicals that are intentionally labeled or intentionally manufactured as nonpolar, like a nonpolar surfactant. A surfactant, you know, changes the, the surface charge, but in general, it takes something that would normally beat up and fall off, turns it flat, and it allows it to pass the barrier a little bit easier. Slow release nitrogen, by and large, does act as a nonpolar surfactant, and, and it changes the polarity of whatever it's mixed with to better match the leaf surface. And so as we foliar feed, we don't just add foliar nutrition in the form of slow release nitrogen. We mix it with other things. We mix it with the things that are valuable to feed at the same time and that are efficient to feed with it so that you don't have to put another pass out in the field. Right. So you're Back mixing. So it's not just nitrogen. You're putting other things in there and utilizing that vehicle, like the, the thing that's going to make it speak the same language so that it can then be absorbed. That's got it. Correct. So if I want to foliar feed something, I take a solution that has phosphorus. I take a solution that has potassium. I have a solution that has sulfur and chlorine and micronutrients. And, and I put as many basketballs, baseballs, and golf balls as I can into that solution. And I make sure that that's stable over a, a, a good pH, a good temperature, and a good pressure range. And then it doesn't have a choice. It will cross the barrier because the polarities match. Plus, we have to um, employ the science of what is that going to get tank mixed with because the whole goal is to be able to, or the guy that's going over his field with a sprayer to also have the ability to apply nutrients at the same time. Absolutely. So if I, if I have baseballs, golf balls, and, and baseballs in the system and I want to put a watermelon in there, that's a different thing. It, yep. it changes the whole system by adding in another unit. So... I want you to touch on the word surfactant. You breezed over it there quick, but I'd, I'd like you to explain to me just exactly what a surfactant is, what it does, how, what, what's going on there when you're talking about that. So a surfactant in, in the industry, a, a common name for it is a sticker spreader. It's, its sole purpose is to take whatever it is that it's being tank mixed with and have it stick to the leaf or spread out onto the leaf more evenly so that it can be fed into the plant through the leaf surface. So if then in the reference of like in order for the plant to be like, oh yeah, no, that's cool. I, I, I understand the language you're speaking. You can come in for like, again, through absorption. The surfactant's like the translator to make sure they're speaking the same language. It's kind of like that. In a sense. Yeah. Um, the yeah, it's 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 the middleman that's that's allowing that interaction to take place. Um, the surfactant is the key fob that you, as another ag chemical, like say say you're a herbicide. Many times you'll have a herbicide that either has a mixed in surfactant or that has a surfactant that comes along with the package. And the reason why you you mix the two together is that that's the key fob. So you're you're the the, the herbicide. The surfactant is the key fob, and now you can open the door on the leaf surface. Thanks, David. Now, let's move on to our special guest interview. Our special guest today is Sean Moreau. Sean is the trailer sales manager here at Flamin. He joined us about two years ago and has brought a wealth of insight and experience. Welcome to the podcast today, Sean. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No problem. No problem. What are you, uh, what is a weekend like for Sean Moreau on a beautiful day? This weekend, it consisted of me putting together a gazebo over the hot tub. So getting ready for winter and that's going to be our, our getaway in the middle of the cold. So can hardly wait to get that fired up and going. Excellent. Excellent. So let's just start from, uh, way back when, Wh where are you from, Sean? Where did you grow up? I grew up, uh, not far from, Saskatoon in Langham, Saskatchewan. Went to uh, elementary school there, uh, most of my high school, and then ended up uh, moving and going to uh, grade 11 and 12 in Rostron. So yeah, Langham is hometown, family farm out there. What's your first childhood memory that you can uh, bring up? The first memorable thing I can, I can think of is... Uh, we went on a big trip to Niagara Falls and we drove out there 
And I remember when we got to Niagara Falls, it was a big deal. And my dad pulled out a stogie to celebrate. And he smoked a big stogie to celebrate being in Niagara Falls. In the vehicle? Yeah, oh yeah, in the vehicle. It was a half ton truck. I'm in between, no seat belts. You know, just, they used arms as seat belts back then. So a regular cab, half ton truck. Absolutely. Yeah. And even better, it was a manual transmission. It was a three on the tree that was converted to a three on the floor. So that was the truck that I grew up in, learned how to drive a three on the floor, half ton Chevy truck. And there's two in your family, two siblings, right? Yeah, just uh, my brother and I. And you and your brother were in the middle of your mom and dad in this pickup truck? Well, my brother was there, but I think I would have to say he was in my mom's belly for that trip. So he didn't need a seatbelt. So there was one and a half of us on that trip. So your dad was celebrating with the Stogie for more than one reason, not just uh, arriving at his destination. Yeah, really great parental, you know, smoking in a vehicle with a pregnant wife. But it was a different time back then. Yeah, we're all in the same demographic. We very much understand. So uh, what are some of the first memories you have of uh, some of the things you did on the farm? You know, we started, my dad's a first generation farmer. So he didn't inherit the farm. He started farming on his own and... As he started to grow, he, he actually needed my brother and I to help him quite a bit. We were cheap labor, and it was a lot of fun. And so I, I remember probably the first thing I remember doing is stacking bales. You know, he would drive the, the tractor, and we had one of those tripod, uh, tripod stacking units where you stack six square bales at a time. And it was my job to grab them out of the baler and, and stack them up, try to keep up with my dad. How old would you have been? Probably eight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right around there. Sean, how do you personally pronounce your last name? Uh, Miro. Miro. Rhymes with hero. Reggie, how did you pronounce it? Miro. Yeah. So it's not French. Uh, it's actually Dutch background, so that's why it's, it's, it's not EAU. It's not French. It's actually German-Dutch background. I feel like when I send you an email, I'm confused every single time I go to type your last name in, and then I just let the auto-populate until a picture of your face pops up. Yeah, I mean, there's more vowels than, than anything, and most people don't get it right. Uh, the most creative spelling I ever had was Miralai. So don't oh, yeah. worry, Moreau, I answer that, no problem. <laughs> so I'm curious, as of today's date, how long have you worked at Flamin for? Uh, right around two years, three months, four days, and 12 hours-ish. <laughs> How do you know that? I made that shit up. Okay. <laughs> couple, couple years, couple years. <clears throat> and so I remember a time when you were hired, and then you're, because you were living in Alberta at the time. So how did, how did that all go? We hired a guy to work out of the Saskatoon store that lived in Alberta. So I was one of those unfortunate people that was... Uh, was impacted by COVID. My job in Alberta ended because of a, you know, I was in the automotive industry and that industry really was hit hard at the time. So as I started looking for an opportunity, because I have family here in Saskatoon and uh, my first two kids were born here, I thought, okay, well, let's take a look to see if there's anything happening back home. On top of that, things in Saskatchewan were booming. Definitely a stronger economy in Saskatchewan than it was in southern Alberta at the time. So as I looked, I came across Flamin and uh, read through the job description, which, by the way, did not totally prepare me for what this job was going to entail. <laughs> However, it was very interesting, and it was right in the wheelhouse, I thought, of my experience. And so I applied, and that's what got the ball rolling. And then... As I went through that process, learned, you know, I know some people and other people, we have friends and acquaintances in common. So it felt comfortable pretty quick. So what was the posting? What was the job description? And how would you describe how you currently hang your hat at the office? Uh, the posting was ag sales manager, which is absolutely where I started. But the awesome thing about Flamin is uh, if you are looking for opportunity, if you volunteer, if you're willing to step up and try different things. So now I'm ag sales manager, but also trailer sales or sales manager. And that's something that I didn't have experience with before. Yeah. 
let's uh, let's go back a little bit to some of your past um, work experiences. What do you remember as being outside of the farm your first job? It's pretty easy, actually. When I was about 11 years old, I started mowing grass and babysitting for a family across the street. And I continued to do that until I was in university for the same family. Uh, they happened to own a white farm dealership. And so between white and Kubota, it turned into a weekend's job when I was young and then a summer job and went all the way until university. It's pretty memorable because not long before they shut down, the owner, Daryl Dirksen, came to me and said, you know, have you ever thought about working in Saskatoon? And I said, well, I have because I live there, but I would never abandon you. And he said, well, you know, probably is the time to start moving, thinking about working in Saskatoon. And here's a couple companies that you could go work for that they're probably pay you more than I pay you. So I went to the interview, showed up, and the guys looked at me and I was like, oh man, I didn't bring a resume. You know, I was 20 years old. I should have known better. But they said, don't worry. You're pretty well re referred and recommended. We don't know a lot of guys that are 20 years old with 10 years of work experience at the same place. <laughs> so yeah, I got that job without a resume. And, and where was that at? It's a grass cutting company. Uh, it's the same guys that have Wilson's greenhouse now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so nice. yeah, started there. Cutting nice. I did that grass cutting job for two summers. When did you decide that potentially a career in sales would be up your alley? I don't know. I don't know if it was ever a, a conscious decision. You know, I went to University of Saskatchewan, got my marketing degree, and back then I think I would have said I wanted to be in advertising. I enjoyed the creativity side of it, but was hired by John Deere right out of university, and they sort of steered me the direction of you know, being a factory rep and more on the sales side. And so just the opportunities brought me that direction. And I don't think it was ever a conscious choice. It just, that's the opportunity and path that kind of opened up before me. You found your way. Yeah. Or it found me. Who has been your most important professional mentor? I'm blessed. I've had a lot. Um, you know, in terms of a model for hard work. My dad, he was the hardest working guy I know. Then I had some, I had some bosses at both John Deere and Harley Davidson that were incredible. And you know, now here working with Sean Geddes, been fantastic. You know, I, I think if you look for it, you can find people who can teach you all kinds of stuff, whether it's product related, whether it's technical, whether it's how to be a good husband, how to be a great dad. You can find people who model good things in a lot of different places. I've been blessed. Had a ton of people who've impacted me. I'm going to flip the script a little bit and just try and get to know you a little bit more with uh, with some questions. I feel the heat turning up here, um, Reg. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Probably my favorite place I've ever been has been Maui in Hawaii. I've been there three times. And I could go there a hundred times. Loved it there. Pace of life, weather, just, just awesome. If you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose? Dead or alive? Yep. Wayne Gretzky. Being an Oilers fan, you know, growing up during that period, to hear those stories, that would be who I'd want to sit with. What was your favorite trip you've ever taken? Once again, been really fortunate to have been on a lot of cool trips. But I think I would say the trip that Carrie, my wife, and I did to New York City. We did a 10-day trip, and we packed a month's worth of activities into 10 days. We went to baseball games, concerts, Broadway uh, musicals, went to restaurants, did tours, Coney Island, you name it. We did all of the, all of the museums, we were exhausted, but it was awesome. You know, we left there going, we didn't miss anything. If you won 10 million tomorrow, what would you spend it on? 
I don't know. I don't, I generally don't play the lottery. And so I don't get caught up in that game of what would I do? Because I kind of know it's not going to happen. But since you put it out there, i uh, probably pay off all my mortgages, which I have more than one. My kids' bills, get them houses. Maybe an Aston Martin car would probably be the, the one luxury thing that I would do for myself. Good call. Yeah. Would you drive it around like James Bond or what would you do with it? Damn right. And I want one that shoots missiles and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, if I'm going to do this, let's do it right. What is your biggest pet peeve? Oh, man, I wish my wife was here. She could tell me all the things that annoy me. Um, I'm going to say on a professional side, my biggest pet peeve is when people disrespect the profession of sales and don't take it serious. I think it's awesome, and I don't think everybody realizes how tough it is and how much work it is and how awesome it can be. And I think that everyone's caught up in the stereotype of 1950s, 60s, greasy, Herb Tarlick, Herb Tarlick, greasy salesman. And that's, that's not what we do. That's not why I'm so passionate about it. It's so it really does bother me when, when people think of it as a lesser profession, because I think it's a higher profession. What do you think the world will look like in 50 years? Once again, you're catching me because I don't generally do that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to go different than I think most people would say. I think 50 years from now, it's going to be awesome. You know, I got three daughters that, you know, they're smart, educated, confident. I know they're friends. And if they represent what the future can be, that's a positive. So I'm going to say things are just going to get better. That's what I'm going to say. That's what I'm going to hope. So I want to go back to the comment you said about uh, the sales profession. And I want you to explain to me what that stereotype is or how you see it. And then I want you to explain how you train the sales representatives to not be that stereotype. The stereotype is that a salesperson will sell anything and say anything to make you buy something, whether you need it or not. And that drives me crazy. It, it really does. And I spend a lot of time and energy helping guys really focus on the way I consider sales. I shouldn't have to say integrity-based sales. To me, integrity is baked in. But for a lot of people, I have to say, we are an integrity-based sales company. And what that means to me and what I help sales reps do on a daily basis is ask questions so that people can tell you what they really, truly need. And then you can help find that for them. And that makes you a problem solver, not a slayer and slinger of goods that they don't know, uh, that they, they don't need. And so you are actually someone who's helping them solve a problem so that when you're done, they're thankful. They appreciate what you've done. And it doesn't feel like you sold them something. All you did was help them get what they need. And, you know, that is what I spend the majority of my time helping young sales reps find their way so that they know how to ask the right questions, how they build that rapport, how they, how they build trust. And so, you know, uh, interesting little side note, Mitch is, you know, one of my deep, dark dreams in life. And I don't tell too many people, but I would love to teach a university course on how to be a professional salesperson. I think I would love to be able to give that, give our profession a little bit of nobility that it isn't a... Well, you couldn't be an engineer, so I guess you're in sales now. It's like, no, it is a trade. It is a profession. It is certifiable just like any other college at a university or at a co uh, university or a college. But I don't think it gets that right now. So that's why I would love to be able to do that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, one thing that was told to me was a, a good salesman has big ears and a small mouth. 
And you have the perception that salespeople do nothing but talk and try and convince. Um, but really is more um, asking the right questions to uncover really what the issues are. And if you can uncover that, then you have an opportunity to maybe try and solve that person's problem. Yeah, I agree. And I think that when you ask good questions, then you become a better listener too. How do you influence your staff? That's a good way of putting that. it. Once again, I'm the beneficiary of, I've been through so much amazing training in my life from sales professionals, courses I've been to, and you know, I've begged, borrow, stolen the best lines, the best opportunities that I've heard over the years, tried to make them my own, and I'm willing to share them with anybody to help them comfortably ask those questions. You know, I think when someone feels like they're having a conversation, it doesn't feel like a script, it doesn't feel put on, it becomes real, and then it's genuine and legit, and when you're in that zone, people will answer your questions because they, they don't feel that there's an agenda. They just think that you're there to help them, which you are. Yeah. And it comes down to trust, right? And I think that's why you're such a positive influence in this place because, um, people trust you, uh, people see it in your eyes and they see how you carry yourself in a day to day basis. And it's easy for them to emulate what you bring to the table. And that's why you're here today. Well, thanks, man. That's a pretty powerful thing. What's your favorite part about coming to work every day? I don't know. Um, I can tell you that in, I can't remember what number I gave you, but in the last two years, three months, four days, and 17 hours, there hasn't been one morning where I woke up and didn't want to come to work. I can tell you that. The people here, the connections, the friendships, we get to come and work with our friends every day. This is the stuff that when we were seven years old, we all dreamt of, and hell, we get to do it. Is there anything specific or any event that stands out that is an example of that? There's a ton. You know, when I think back to the last two years, we went to Top Gun Maverick together as a team. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it was. We Actually, ha- just explain that quick for the listeners. What what does that mean? We went to Top Gun Maverick. What? So the social committee here at Flamin decided, not decided, got the opportunity to rent out an entire theater for the staff. And we got to go to watch Top Gun Maverick a day before it opened to the rest of the public. So we had an entire theater full of just Flamin staff and significant others to watch a movie that hadn't even opened yet. That was super cool. Yeah, that was fun. Something that's probably top of mind for me is we had a Flamin' Ping Pong tournament, and that was uh, a wonderful, wonderful experience for a number of reasons. For those of you that don't know, um, playing ping pong against Sean would essentially be like playing one-on-one against Wayne Gretzky because he comes at it with his attitude, and either he's put in many, many hours of ping pong time or he's just a naturally good athlete, um, but he will absolutely destroy most people I- in this location. And honestly, he will do it with one hand in his pocket too, kind of like he's showing off. Yeah, is that for balance? Why do you put that hand in the pocket? Or are you showing off? What is that? I don't know. What, it's kind of like Ricky Bobby. Like, yeah. where, where else do you put your hands? I, I have no <laughs> idea. I just, I've literally always played with one hand in my pocket. Did you have a podium finish that night? Yeah, I was pretty top of the near the top of the podium. So I've known you for about two years. I believe, yeah. you know, I would have started interviewing around this time of the year, um, a couple of years ago. And you were, you sat in on my first interview, actually. I did. Um, and in all You're that welcome. time, yeah, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, and all Reg, that time, Reg, what were you interviewing for? I actually wasn't sure at the time. They just said, <laughs> come in and talk to some people. I assumed it had to do with sales, but I did not know. Yeah, he's still in probation. We'll yeah, find a spot for him. Figure it out. Um, but in all that time I've known you, I have never beaten you in anything—in a game of cards, in a game of ping pong, in poker, 
nothing. And I like to think that's not a, re- a, a representation of how I play. It's more of a representation of how you play, and you're just that good. Hey, I don't know about that. Just wait. The, I think there is a sport you could beat him at. I'm trying to figure it out. Well, so you're a better golfer at me, buddy. Well, we'll have to prove it. We'll oh, see. we went golfing. I saw it. He's better. He beat you at golf. Yeah. He oh, did. Okay. So um, I, I'm not sure I won that day. I'm gonna give you the win, bud. Okay, thanks. Humble too. So there's a sport. Um, I like to call it fishing. Fishermen like to call it angling. And so, like, I believe the um, I believe the goal of this sport is to put a little metal hook on a fishing on a piece of string, yep. and then you use a rod. Then you put the hook in the water, yep. and then like a fish comes at it, and then bites the hook. And then you trick it, like you pull the rod up and the fish comes in the boat. That all seems accurate. Okay. So I don't Reg, like where I, this is going. Actually, Reg, I'm I'm gonna ask you, um, if you went fishing and you didn't even get into the boat and you didn't even take your fishing rod, and then you went back at the end of the day, how many fish did you catch? Um, probably none. So zero. Exactly. Okay. So a good fisherman probably catches more than zero fish. And an average to awful fisherman catches zero. That is true. Like, that would be called not being on the board. Sean, there was a time, I believe, you you might have even been bragging about how good a fisherman you were. And then I remember you came and we asked how many fish you caught. How many fish did you catch that day? I think the answer you're looking for is minus one. How is that? possible because as Regan just laid out to me if you were an average to awful fisherman and didn't even get in the boat you would have started that day with zero fish or is that like a sandbagging maneuver like you actually want to start the day with a handicap how do you catch zero fish I'm just curious well the catching the zero fish part I think any every fisherman has had that happen where you get skunked and I did get skunked this day the rest of the boat didn't get skunked. The rest of the boat was on fire. They're throwing fish into the into the live well like crazy. At the end of the day, we put all those fish into a pail, and I started carrying it back to shore, and one of the fish jumped out of the pail into the water, <laughs> which took me from zero fish <laughs> to <laughs> minus one. And, you know, Fortunately, nobody forgets these things, mm. it, no. but it's brought up in a podcast. Um, Geddes also took the opportunity to made sure that he sent a text to Don on that one and had Don call me and <laughs> ask me how I had <laughs> minus one fish. So, well, there you go, Reg. Yeah, I guess. I stand correct. I feel so much better about myself now. Yeah, so he's yeah. not good at everything, except <laughs> then there was like, a, I don't know, I'm going to say a fishing weekend where he went to the cabin with his brother and he made sure... In a group text, he sent 48 pictures of massive fish to like try and prove his way out of this hole that he put himself in, which will be an indefinite hole. You'll actually never just get, subject him to more ridicule because we didn't prove that he actually caught the fish. Right. Yes. He thought there was all lindens, and he handed the rod over. Yeah, I will take your barbs, boys, mm. because a good fisherman doesn't need the justification of others. I know that it. I can catch fish when I need to. And the truth of the matter is I just love fishing. I don't care if they're little. I don't care if they're big. I don't care if I don't catch any. Minus one's hard to take, but uh, you know what? Just going out, being on the water, enjoying the quiet. I love it. There's no doubt. If you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Don't be so cocky. You don't know everything. If you would have hooked my 18-year-old self to a lie detector, he would have passed if you asked him, do you know everything? Yeah. I think he would have. Yeah. Would have passed that. He was wrong, Mm -hmm. but he was confidently wrong. (laughs) Well, you haven't lost your confidence, Sean. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Where is this going? I'd say there's a difference, too, with being confident and being arrogant. Yeah. I don't think I've ever experienced you for a second being arrogant. No. When you put your hand in your pocket and play ping pong, I still don't see that as arrogant, although it 
annoys me. When but, you're down 20 to yeah, nothing, yes. you cannot help but see that as arrogant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Yeah, no problem. But I think that, you know, all of us over time with the experiences, uh, victories, challenges, losses, failures, if you learn from all of them, you know, you get to a point where, okay, I can see how this pertains and how you can use this and how you can grow and how you can help yourself, how you can help others from that experience. So yeah, I've been pretty fortunate to have a lot of victories and a lot of failures because you learn from both. If you were to write a book, what would it be called and what would it be about? Ironically, I have thought about writing a book and it's not going to be what you think, but I would write a book about for young people entering the work world on how they can be successful entering the work world that's run by, you know, people of, in our generation. So they know what our expectations are. And that same book could be read by us so that we can understand what the next generation, what their, what their work ethic, what their goals, what their passions are so that we can find a meeting of the minds so that we can build an environment where they're successful and we're successful because right now it doesn't feel like the generations in the work world are, are melding. Do you see that in your own kids entering the work world and how you may have been different when you were that age? I see a lot of, a lot of similarities and differences, uh, you know, and it's, it's also the expectations of the work world and it's the expectations of what, what we get out of the work experience. You know, it's not just a simple exchange of labor produced money given, you know, people want to have a meaningful work experience. So trying to find that entire balance with, you know, the world different than the way it was when we were kids. Let's be honest. There was, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet when we were kids, but it's there now and it's impacting everything. So just everything's different. Yeah. How, how do you try and um, meld the gap for your own staff that are younger than you? How do you try and create a work environment that is exactly that? It is a, a, something that people can come in with a lot of passion and and understanding that this is a career path and I want to grow here, um, not just the company, but I want to grow myself? A lot of questions, a lot of what's important to you, what do you want to get out of this? I find that the approach that works really well, I, I call it project-based. When you find out what somebody's passionate about, you give them a project that allows them to do those things whether it's short-term, long-term, whether it's a couple hours a day or it's major. But if people are working on things that they enjoy, they're going to do better and they're going to enjoy that time. So if you can find a natural, you know, a natural bridge that works between what we need and what their passions are, that, that goes a long ways. But again, it comes down to asking the right questions. It's not a lot different than the sales that we're talking about. Exactly. I mean, whether it's, you know, I, I said being a successful salesperson is helping people solve a problem. Well, people who are new in a workplace, it, I'm, not that it's a problem, but this is new. And if you can find that happy meeting place for all sides, that's solving a problem. The, uh, the nice part is we have the freedom here uh, from a management standpoint to try and create that environment because we understand we have a lot of young people that we would like to be um, part of our team for a long period of time. Um, and we understand what it was like for us to be at that age. And we have the ability to do the right things to try and um, create an environment that they want to be here as well. It's a great point, Regan. And you want to go back to one thing you asked Mitch, you know, what is the one thing that you're most excited about or that you enjoy the most? One of the things that really struck me when I came to Flamin is the amount of empowerment and trust and rope and responsibility that you have right from the time you start. 
in most companies, you start at the bottom and people remind you that you're at the bottom and you have to work your way up to the top or even to a place where people will trust and respect you. At Flamin, from day one, trust was given and empowerment was given. There was no warm-up period. There was no probation. It was just, you're here. We want you. Go do it. It was awesome. It was weird Mm -hmm. because most companies aren't like that. They make you earn trust. They make you prove that you fit in. But here they allowed us to just be ourselves and get at it right from the beginning. That That's pretty unique. You go through a, a cultural change, you know, from even my own experiences from my last position to coming here. I still catch myself once in a while because I'll, re-va- I'll revert back to the old hierarchy and, you know... Uh, you have to tell yourself that I am good enough to be here and this is where I need to be. And this is why I want to be here. Yeah. I've, I've worked a lot of corporate in my background, you know, 20 years of corporate and 10 years of retail, kind of, if you mix it up that way. And some of the corporate stuff that the process, the structure, the formality, then you come here and it's just figure it out. Yeah. there, there isn't a manual on how to do it is we brought you here to do it. You're the, you're the process. Now you're do the, it. you're the manual, go get it. Yeah. But it, you know, like I said, is there's that trust that is not always, not always there in the work world anymore. You know, there's a lot more skepticism and questions and arm's length. Yep. You got to earn it. And that, that's, that's what I loved about here. One of the many things. Okay, Sean. So how we like to end these is by going through a series of rapid fire questions. You ready? Whoa. So rapid fire questions, but they can be long answer, right? Absolutely. Good. Cause I'm not good at short answer. <laughs> okay. Question number one, what is the largest sale you have either made yourself or been a part of in your career? I was going to say, it was a sale here at Flamens, but I guess technically it would be from my Harley days because I was a part of a number of dealer buy-ins and stuff. So there would have been some 20 to 30 to maybe $40 million transactions of people buying into dealerships. I know this is supposed to be rapid fire, but we never did get into your Harley days here. What, what is the scariest story you remember from your Harley days? In all honesty... There's nothing scary about Harley. The funniest thing is that everybody thinks of it as this great, big, badass company. They are the most conservative vanilla company ever. (laughs) Because they have such a reputation in the marketplace, they've got to be so squeaky clean on the publicly traded environment. Plus, I worked for the finance division. So, yeah, absolutely the most... Squeaky clean, vanilla, right down the middle company you've ever worked for. I mean, it was awesome, but hardly any edgy stuff. So you never had to go and sit down with the Hells Angels and sell, you know, 20 bikes at a time or anything like that? Not a chance. Although I guess I did go to a couple of rallies and, uh, you know, 105th anniversary parties. And there were some sketch things that happened there, but they weren't actually corporate events. Those were dealer events and dealers can get away with a lot more stuff <laughs> than the corporates can. Did you wear like a bandana and a leather jacket and those slip on tattoos, like forearm tats? Bandana, no. Leather jacket, yes. Slip on tats, never. Do you still have a set of assless chaps at home that you put on every once in a while? I'm so glad you mentioned that. I, I am very passionate about the fact that there's no such thing as assless chaps. All chaps have no ass. Otherwise they'd be leather pants. Wow. <laughs> I learned something today. You were just saving that, eh? Well, I didn't know it was coming. Breakfast, lunch, or supper? Lunch. Steak or hamburgers? Hamburgers? Like Fo- them both. Football or hockey? Football. Favorite sports team? Dallas Cowboys. Favorite athlete? Whoa. 
this is edgy, but I'm going to say Tom Brady. I actually don't think he's that great of an athlete, but he is an amazing man. Spring or fall? Fall. How many motorcycles do you have? One. Harley Davidson or China motorcycle? Harley Davidson. Coffee or beer? Does Guinness count as both? Wow. What a good answer. Very See, good there answer. is meaning behind some of these things sometimes. Yeah. Out of the box or out of the circle? Don't know what either one of those means, so I'm going to say out of the Wrong box. Answer. Yeah, didn't matter. You, that, you failed that one. See, you learn from failure. I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to learn from that, but I'll take it. Boys or girls? Girls. I have three of them. Four of them. Is the dog a boy or a girl? The dog is also a girl. Wow. It's easier for me to just sit down to pee. That's just, that's the way it works in our house. You left-handed or you right-handed? Right-handed. Dominantly it, right-handed? Dominantly right-handed, although I can play ping pong left-handed and I shoot hockey left-handed. Of course you can. Hunting or fishing? Fishing. Do you ever go out hunting and end up coming home with minus one anything? You mean like I brought a deer back to life? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I, I shot a deer and it fell off the back of the truck. So. I found a dead deer in the ditch. I went and shot it. It got up and ran away. <laughs> you got any of those stories? No, I can say, though, I did grow up hunting with my dad and, you know, loved the early mornings going out. It just kind of stopped once I went to university and, you know, just ran out of time and then work got in the way. But growing up, went hunting with my dad all the time. Camping or cabin? Cabin. Mm. Beach or pool? Pool. I don't like sand in my crack. Ice fishing or boat fishing? Boat fishing. I can stay home and get drunk. <laughs> That's what ice fishing is. <laughs> Beer or whiskey? Beer. I don't get so sloppy on beer, although I get sloppy on beer. Yeah, like but I get worse sloppy on real whiskey. Real know your limits kind of guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Favorite place to watch a professional sports game? I've been blessed to go to lots. I'm going to say the new Dallas Cowboys st stadium. Been there three times and watched a playoff game, and it was incredible. Made the hair on the back of my neck stand up when 98,000 people go crazy. I feel like I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Rock concert or concert in general or a sporting event? I'm going to say sporting event. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad are you at COVID? <laughs> I'm pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty bad. Yeah, we should probably talk about COVID a little bit. Just, I don't know if we should or not, but I'll just say, um, for those that don't know, I got pretty sick during COVID and it's probably another awesome believe it or not covid's been really hard on me i lost my job got really sick was in the hospital and yet it's one of the blessings that i've had in my life because without covid i wouldn't have ended up here at flamin while i was here and got sick the way the way management and ownership treated me and my family was incredible it created a loyalty and a bond that that you can't have otherwise and so <clears throat> excuse me, not getting emotional, just a sore throat. Right. And maybe a little emotional. But in particular, my wife got to see the awesomeness that I experienced every day and the way you guys and our teammates took care of my family was incredible. Was so, she still in Alberta at that time? Not only was she in Alberta, she was getting surgery at the same time I was in the hospital. So... Imagine my kids at home, my three teenage daughters, their mom's getting surgery in one hospital and their dad's pretty sick and with COVID in another hospital and they can't go see either because of protocols and stuff of that nature. So yeah, it was a pretty hard time. You were more than pretty sick. You were like dying. I was hallucinating <laughs> a little here and there, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was an incredible tough time for my family. And it's, it seems so long ago because I've come through and I don't have any long-term COVID effects that I'm aware of. And it, it does, it seems like so long ago, but my memory of it was how well we were treated and taken care of by 
my Flam and family. It 100% um, you know, allowed me to reconnect with people and have some, you know, hear some meaningful stories. And <clears throat> sometimes you forget the impact you may have had in someone else's life. And all of a sudden they reach out and say, you know, thanks for when you did this. And you go, holy smokes, I didn't realize that that, that was so meaningful yeah. and powerful for you. And then when you hear people say that, it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And then nice to have that impact on, on people in a positive way. Thank you for listening to Flam and Connect. For Mitch Flamin and Regan Kuntz, I'm Trevor Grindy. Join us next time. Talk to you soon.